What's up, Menopod? Welcome to another episode of the Menopause Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. G. Now, today we're going to be talking to Kelly Lewis. Kelly is passionate about helping women tap into their personal power through travel. She's the founder of Go Girl Guides, the world's first series of travel guidebooks for women. She's also the founder of the annual Women's Travel Fest, creator of Damesley, a boutique women's travel company. Kelly's also the author of Tell Her She Can't. It's a manifesto for every woman who's been told she's not strong enough, smart enough, or capable enough. In the book, she not only shares her personal story of resilience, but she shares the true stories of 35 inspirational women who overcame the naysayers to achieve their impossible dreams. You know, ultimately, we are the ones who say we can't. And when we internalize and believe what others have told us, that is how we stop believing. And for years, I thought it was fat. In fact, until recently, at every stage of my life, I thought it was fat. And this started when I was a prepubescent child in ballet class. It got so bad that every time I looked in the mirror, I told myself I hated myself because I was just so fat. And when I finally realized that this thinking was most likely the cause of my continued self-loathing and poor food choices, I set myself on a quest to change it. And remember, the menopause movement has one purpose, to help end the suffering caused by menopause through transformational education and coaching. And we want to help you too. So head on over to menopausemovement.com, take the quiz there, and not only will you discover your type, but we'll also tailor some offerings to help you take back your life from menopause. You know, getting into the driver's seat of my life was the first step I took to overcome the changes that I experienced with menopause, but I did it alone and it was really lonely. So the menopause movements created a community of women who are unapologetically deciding to become their best selves one small action at a time. And you can too. Join our community and start to create a life you love. Now today's, on today's episode, we talk about why Kelly wrote Tell Her She Can't. The role childhood belief systems play in shaping our outlooks on life. Personal choice is a rallying cry for freedom and independence. How educators shape our lives, especially when we are children. How we talk to ourselves matters. How COVID became the catalyst for her book. And stay to the end for Kelly's advice on how to create accountability to make sure you complete any project you start. At the end of the episode, visit menopausemovement.com forward slash blog, where you can find the show notes, plus the links to the books and resources mentioned in the episode. If you enjoy the episode, be sure to leave a written review, like, and subscribe on YouTube, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast, so you're always the first to know when each episode is released. Who should we have on the podcast? And what can we do to make it better? We want to hear from you. I want to hear from you. So send me a a direct message on Instagram at Dr. Michelle Gordon or on Facebook also at Dr. Michelle Gordon. Or you can send me an email, Dr. Gordon at menopausemovement.com, D-R-G-O-R-D-O-N at menopausemovement.com. Thanks so much for being a part of the menopause movement today. And now let's get to Kelly. So Kelly, welcome to the Menopause Movement Podcast. I'm so happy to have you here today. Yay, thank you so much for having me. So you've written this book. It's called Tell Her She Can't, is that right? Correct. All right, so you wrote this book. Why did you write the book? Well, I wrote the book because Tell Her She Can't is kind of like my personal motto. (laughs) Like I've always (laughs) just been the kind of person where it's like, if you tell me I can't do something, I will do it because you told me I couldn't do it, <laughs> just to prove you wrong. So I was, you know, I had a book kind of kicking around in my psyche that I knew that I wanted to write for a while, but I didn't know what it was going to be called or how it was going to be structured. Um, but then, yeah, I was taking a bath and I kept hearing, tell her she can't, tell her she can't. And I was like, oh my God, that's totally my motto. <laughs> like, yeah, and all, yeah. I've always been the like obstinate one, you know, the difficult one. <laughs> So I'm sure a lot of women in our audience um, have dealt with this because we live in a patriarchy. We talk about the patriarchy almost every, every episode and uh, you know, I'm, I'm right there with you. I was never, never one to let anyone tell me what I could do. And I, I, there's something that happened in high school. I I took a, 
biology class and it was, you know, it might've been an AP of biology. I don't know. I didn't take a lot of AP classes cause I wasn't, I wasn't a gunner, but, um, <laughs> I, I remember in the first day I was joking around with my friends that were in the class and the, and the teacher said to me, I know who's going to do well in this class and who's not. And he's looking straight at me as if like his expectations were that I was going to fail. And I was like, well, you know, F you, man, I'm going to, I'm going to really prove it to you that I'm not stupid just because I joke around. And so I got an A in that class and, and I ended up actually majoring in biology and in college, but I just, I just think that that's, you know, so many of us are oppositionally defiant, Right. And my son's the same way. And so I often have to like get him to, you know, make it his idea to get him to do something. Um, because if you tell him he's gonna, you know, he's got to do something, he's not gonna, you know, he's not gonna want to do it. So nobody likes being told what to do. Can you give us an, an example of something in your life that helped to, you know, make this motto happen? For oh, you? for sure. Yeah. So this motto came to me, you know, by default because I grew up in a really, abusive household where yeah. there was a constant power dynamic between myself and, you know, my stepfather, my step family, where it was always like they would do anything they could to push me down physically, mentally, emotionally, you know, to keep me held under, to tell me that I was, I wasn't good enough. You know, I wasn't smart enough. I didn't fit in. I wasn't X, Y, and Z enough, you know? And so this kind of like attitude of like, screw you really came because I, I mean, I had to, like it was how I had to survive, you know? Yeah. Um, and like that really could have, that experience, like the way that I grew up really could have like shaped my life for the worse if I had let it. Um, mm -hmm. But I was really fortunate that when I was like 11 years old, my mother sat me down and she said, you know, you have two choices. Like you can let this destroy you, you know, and down the road, no one's going to blame you if, you know, whatever happens with your life, or you can use it as fuel, you know, you can use it as fuel to prove that you're better than they are. And I think had it not been for that one conversation, I don't know, like, I don't know what my life would have become. But in that moment at 11, I was like, screw this. You know, and by the way, mom, screw you too, because like you helped yeah. put me in this position, right? right so, but right. I was just angry, and I like I had to just kind of work that out. But the only way out was to like fight my way out. You know, I had to get good grades, I had to get into college, I had to have some place to go. So, that really pushed me to like, you know, go forward in life. And like, I always wanted to be a journalist. So I remember thinking in those days, like one day you're going to see my name on the front page of the newspaper, you know, like one day you're going to see it. And, um, yeah. sure enough, I mean, that's what I did. I went to school for journalism and then I was writing for the Arizona daily star and all over the front page was my name. And I remember my mom like in college put it up on their fridge, you know, and I was like, oh, yeah, wow, screw so you. You got to look at it. <laughs> you know, Ryan holiday wrote this book called the obstacle is the way. And it's really about, about stoics and, and how, you know, when you see an obstacle in your life and how you perceive it, when you can get through that obstacle and go, th you know, go through it and turn it into, you know, I think it's really a perspective shift, but when you can turn that obstacle into an asset, then, then that, that really helps us to, to move forward. And, you know, it, I think it's the same sort of thing. I mean, I grew up in a pretty abusive household too, and my abuse was different from yours. I didn't have a step parent, but I had, uh, I had some pretty severe abuse and I remember never, ever, ever allowing that to define me. And, and I think it was really hard for those people that tried to, you know, push me down and tell me I wasn't good enough and all those things. And I would always just came, come back to curiosity. I always, just always came back to curiosity. That was my thing. And we have this saying here at the menopause movement, which is suffering is optional. And I think that when we, when we make the choice that, you know, we're going to get through this, but we don't have to suffer. I think that's really, really freeing. And it's hard, it's a hard lesson to learn, but it sounds like it's something you learned when you were 11. Yeah. I mean, I think it started at 11, like the idea that I had personal choice started at 11, right? That yeah. I had the ability to choose how the environment affected me and what course my life could go on that was that point for me at 11. And a lot of people, you know, it takes a long time. Some people never reach that point. Some people are always looking for that, right? So like, so I was really lucky that that happened to me at a very young age. And then from that point forward, I had to decide like, 
all right, how are we going to do this? What's the path? You know, I had to get really logistical about it. Like, if you get to X, then how do you get to Z? You know, like these kinds of things. But then, you know, when I turned 30, I just all of a sudden was like, you know, I, I really like powered through and I kicked ass in my career and, you know, I work in the women's travel industry. So I really helped to create what women's travel looks like, quote unquote. I was a pioneer in that space and I was really just like charging forward and creating these businesses and, you know, doing all these things, getting all this press. And then I turned 30 and I was like, oh my God, I am not okay. Like, I am not okay, right? So it's like all of those things that I held with me that I didn't think affected me for a really long time just started, like, bombarding me. And then I really, you know, I was like, it's time for me to actually really work on the root of this. Like, get some therapy. Talk to someone about this, you know. And I did I did hypnotherapy. I did talk therapy. I did Reiki. I mean, anything that I could do because I was just like, I just... You know, and I was seeing the same patterns play out in my dating life, right? Like for many years, I was dating men who were kind of like my stepdad, who were kind of jerks, who would put me down, who would take from me, you know, and I just like, I just had to finally get to the point where I was like, enough, <laughs> I'm rewriting this. And I think only after doing that was I able to write this book, right? Because it was like, mm -hmm. I had to get to a place where I could heal enough to talk about it. And then I could talk about it from a place of strength, not not being trapped in it still. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, resilience. We spend a lot of time talking about resilience here at the menopause movement and, and how we have a choice in life, uh, just about about it, just about everything. But, you know, coming from an abuse background, that, that it, we just start with resilience there as a general rule, right? So for somebody who, you know, maybe didn't, didn't, have abuse in their background how how would you how would you say you know they can start to develop some resilience and what does that mean i think really stepping into the power of personal choice right like mm -hmm. in every instance like you always like you are the captain of your ship right so like you're not just being tossed around by life like i think when you get strength in making decisions and clarity of making decisions like that is the first step towards being more resilient just realizing that you're driving like you are in the driver's seat you know um i think that's the first part and i actually i talk i've talked to many many women about resilience and defiance and you know the kind of like tell her she can't attitude um and it isn't like inherent in a lot of people it's developed or it's recognized over many years like wait a minute i could do that you know like wait a minute nobody is stopping me from this so i always think to myself like i play this game where it's like well what if i was an accountant what would that look like you know what if i moved to bali for a year you know and i yeah. think asking yourself these kinds of questions like well what if i did that like just letting yeah, I yourself think that's, so, that's so good because curiosity is is like the key to uh an amazing life but yeah and it reminds choice, you it just reminds you that you can do anything right it reminds you yeah. that like yeah if you so decide then that is like that is achievable for you in your life yeah i i want to you know say that there's a couple places where i learned about personal choice and and that that made a big difference for me and a about, you know, 15, maybe 20 years ago, I read this book by Jack Canfield called The Success Principles. And in that book, he says, you know, whenever there's a possibility, you know, act as if you have a choice. And even if it's something, he tells a story of somebody who had a, they, they walked into a classroom and there were different colored, like, what are they, peaches or, or folders? Yeah, folders, that's the word, uh, that were on the desk, right? And the person, you know, is like, oh, yeah, I really want a green one. And that person has the green one and I have yellow and I don't like yellow. And it was like, you know, I'm just going to see if we can switch and just act as if you have a choice. And it's something so small, you know, but that when you start to take little teeny steps, that's where the, you know, a lot of, a lot of change can happen. And then again, there's another book I read a few, a few years ago by Vishen Lakiani. Do you know who he is? So he's the founder of Mind Valley, and Mind Valley is a you know global school for personal growth. And he wrote this book called The Code of the Extraordinary Mind, and I really recommend it because he talks about how there are what he calls bullshit rules or brules 
in the world. And they're just beliefs that we have because we grew up in a certain way and we thought that this was true. And when you start to look at things as, you know, institutionalized as marriage and monogamy and and not that not that those aren't good things for some people but maybe they're not good things for other people and you start to realize that there are no rules there are no rules we can we can make it up and we can choose to live the way we want um that i think really it, it really was freeing for me when he when he taught that Yeah, totally. And like, we need those reminders again and again, right? Because it's so easy to fall into like, the routine of your life where you are just kind of going through the motions, you are just waiting for your paycheck, you are, you know, you're just paying bills, it gets monotonous, right? So you, you need those reminders, you need whatever book or messaging that reminds you that like, you could still if if tomorrow you decide you don't want to do any of it, you don't have to, you know, and I think I think like we really just need to keep encouraging that. And sometimes, you know, like how you were talking about your teacher, like sometimes it is something so tiny and small as, and and I heard so many times in the course of doing interviews for this book, it was educators that were the first Mm. people who said, you know, I don't think you can do that. Like, I don't really think writing's in your future or, you know, I don't really know that I see art for you. And, you know, sometimes when we're young, we're just like, oh, okay, yeah. Sure, maybe you just close that pathway, right? That door is just not a thing you think about. But like, you really, it's really unfortunate that it happens so young, right? But like, we have to be vigilant of when people are trying to close doors to us and why, and like intentionally push through them, right? Because if you had listened, if you had been like, yeah, you're right, I'm probably gonna fail biology. Like who knows what the course of your life and career would have ended up. Yeah, that's, that's really good. And, you know, educators do play a huge role in shaping us. I mean, we spend a lot of our time from the age of five until we're about 18 in, in school. And we have to remember, and I think it's really important, especially for those of us who have, you know, children or grandchildren who are in school, we have to remember that the school system is still based on creating factory workers, and it's it it's set it's there to not you know to have people think the same way all the time to go from from bell to bell to bell to eat at a certain time to you know and and it's not it's not really about education so much as it's about let's shape their minds to believe certain things and that's why i have so much admiration for people who actually take their kids and travel the world and do homeschooling <laughs> Totally. Yeah. And you have to think about like their perspectives. Like we put so much on educators too. Like we pack classrooms full of students. (laughs) They're just people living their lives. So, you know, from their perspective, they're probably not thinking like, oh, if I tell Johnny he's not good at art, that like the lifelong consequences of that one tiny sentence. Right. But like, you know, that's why it's up to us, you know, maybe when you get older and you, you feel pulled to try art, to like really explore that and to think back like, well, why didn't I ever think that I could do this? Like what, you know, question everything. <laughs> that's that. Well, that's such a good point because a few, about a year ago, I, you know, I got this, you know what a remarkable is? It's like, it's this, this, it's really, I'm a, such a techie, right? And so there's this, it's like a paper tablet. It's like paper, but it's not paper. And it has these, you know, these cool pen things that, that like lets you, um, right on the, on the surface of it. So, and it feels like paper. It's not like writing on an iPad. And so I was about a year ago, I was sitting there, it was fall time. It was about this, about this time looking out my window and I drew a picture of what I saw and I sent it to one of my clients. Who's also, who's like a full-time artist now. And I said, well, I'm not an artist, but here's a sketch. <laughs> And she's like, well, yeah, you got to do some watercolors. And, and so my mom was an artist. And so I was never an artist. And so it's just, you know, trying things and, you know, nobody's ever good at, at a few things when they're born, right? You're not, you're not good necessarily at communication. You're not born with really good communication skills. You're not born with really great self-esteem, especially if you grow up like we did. And you're not born with, um, you know, as you grow up and start to have, you know, sexual desire, you're not born as an excellent lover, Right. And so these are all things that we can develop a skill set around. And, and we, I think we forget to be curious about, wow, where, you know, what can I do in my life to, to make it better? You know, you totally. Know and that was also yeah. like a big reason I wanted to write this book. So this book is not just my story, right? I interviewed 35 women across the board, different ages, different races, different ethnicities to talk about like 
who told them they can't and what they did instead. And some of these women did remarkable things, like became the first woman to cross-country ski Antarctica solo, right? <laughs> like really, really went That's out amazing. there and did really crazy things. But some women are just living regular lives, right? And like each story to me is so profound because, you know, I have a, a great story in the book about a woman who um, married into Jehovah's Witness and was just constantly told all the things that she couldn't do and then kind of lost her identity in that relationship, which so often happens. And then coming out of that relationship had to kind of rebuild like, well, what do I like? You know, like what skills do I like? Do I like Krav Maga? Do I like pottery? Am I good at language? You know, and I think like that's so relatable. So it's like it, I wanted to show these diverse array of experiences because it's like, it happens to all of us. Right? The world is constantly telling us that we can't, that we're not enough, that it's not safe, that it's not smart, that you know, <laughs> you're not strong enough, you know, whatever. All of these different things that the world tells us, we all go through it. And I think showing the diverse array of experiences and how other women have navigated that course and like just been really, you know, defiant in pursuing what they want to pursue because they want to pursue. I think yeah. that's really inspirational, you know, and it's like, I think only in telling so many different stories from different perspectives can you really show that picture. You know, I have another story in the book of a woman who started a YouTube channel at age 78. And now sure. at age 81, she has six million subscribers. <laughs> like, she's a total badass, right? But yeah. who, but can you imagine her, her grandkids who were like, I don't know, Graham, like, are you sure you want to start a YouTube channel? Like how many people doubted that she could do that, you know? Well, I think I think it's really important to to realize, especially for for my audience, the the menopause movement. You know, anyone who's around menopause or postmenopausal is that you know, Colonel Sanders was in his sixties when he finally you know cracked the code to to get Kentucky Fried Chicken to become a a thing, right? And it, you know, Tina Fey, I think I think had a lot of uh, you know upsets and and fails and and stuff before she won her Mark Twain. Yeah, she got the Mark Twain award. And I mean even Oprah was fired from television. And so we have to remember that that the way the universe works is that it's going to, you know, the universe always has our backs, right? And so we have to, you know, kind of try and work with it and if if the door closes it it doesn't mean that the door has to stay closed, but it might mean that we just have to open it, you know, just a smidge over here you know, to just a smidge to the right instead of, you know, right in the middle. Yeah. And I think in life there's like natural reevaluation points, right? So like mm. graduation, you're like, oh God, I have so many options. What do I do? You know, yeah. or um, divorce, right? Menopause. I mean, there's lots of things, times at retirement, there's times in our lives when we're like, you know, we have to reevaluate, like what's, who are we? What's our priority? And what are we interested in that we never let ourselves like dream about? You know, what have we never yeah. allowed to ourselves? Well, I think there's it's the importance of reevaluation is really important uh, for us to talk about, and the reason I say that is that in menopause, at least for me, uh, became this point where I was like, I hate my life. I don't want to be a surgeon anymore, you know. And I was, of course, I was told I couldn't be a surgeon in high school. I couldn't be a doctor, you know. I was like, oh, you don't have the aptitude to be a doctor. I'm like, I'll show you, um, and and I ended up, you know, doing it, but. Um, you know, what happened for me was I was like, menopause hit me and, and I couldn't figure it out. And it was like, like, I'm, I'm, I've always been a high achiever. I've always been able to, you know, meet any goal I set in front of myself. And, you know, my biggest struggle at that time was weight loss. And I was like, why can't I crack this code? It's really, you know, I don't want to wait until menopause is over. And then I started doing research on menopause and it's like, oh, menopause never ends. Wow. This is a new phase in my life and I have to manage it. And so what do I have to do to manage? And so for me, before I could even lose weight, I had to like, become like so accepting of myself like where am I now and how am I you know how am I gonna you know there was, so there was a big a big whole personal development kind of arc that I had to go through before I could even love myself enough to make the changes I needed to make for weight loss that I wanted right and so it's just it's just that menopause is just this time where we can reevaluate and that's of course where the menopause movement podcast we got to talk about menopause for sure. But I mean, weight stuff, like body stuff, you know, we carry that around forever. Mm. And if you grew up like I did, hearing how fat you were, like how, how different your body is, 
you know, yeah. that becomes like a mental barrier that you're like, oh, but I can't do a podcast because then I'm going to be visible or like, oh, I can't do video because then people are going to see me and I'm too fat for them to see me. Right. So we carry this like internal messaging and like you just have to keep <laughs> it's an everyday thing. Like you, I have to keep checking myself and being like, no, damn it. You're beautiful. <laughs> you're not going right. to you're not going to subscribe yeah. to this. But well, I tell I tell the ladies, you know, who come into some of our programs, I'm like, get in front of the camera this holiday season, because you do that for them. You don't do that for you. And you don't you don't look at it and, and say, well, I was too fat or whatever. But, you know, th those are memories and those are really important. Yep. For the people that you love. Totally. But, you know, to the greater point of that, it's like a lot of these women that I was talking to for this book, I said, who told you you can't? And they're like, but I told myself I can't. Right. And right. I'm like, yes, you did. But where did you get that messaging? Like, where did that start? You know, and for a lot of us, it's it's weight, especially as women, as young women. Mm. We have parents who are like, you know, I have terrible memories of like my mom withholding things until I lost weight, you know, or like like I've talked to other women whose parents used to weigh them all the time. I mean, like weight is such a hefty thing for young women to carry around. And that never goes away through your life. So, you know, you have right. to just always prove to yourself that that you, you just have to keep testing that belief right and just being like yeah but I'm gonna choose to not not listen to that yeah well we we it's usually by the time we're seven years old or so our beliefs are pretty much fixed and we have to then start to consciously undo them and you know as somebody who like I, I took ballet from a long long time like from five to 13 or something and um, I never loved ballet but my mom did you know and I always, I, I just, I always had a thicker body. I was really muscular and athletic and I always felt like the fat kid. And, and it, it really wreaked havoc with my self-esteem until I was like, I'm not going to look in the mirror and see a fat woman anymore. I'm going to look in the mirror and say, I love you. And that was the, that was the start, right? 100%. Yeah. And you have to keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. No, you got to do it every day. I mean, it's, it's a kind, you know, it's it, decision to change. You know, when, when we decide that we want to make a choice and, and we want to make a change in our lives, you know, we have to become we have to become aware of it. Right. It always starts with awareness like, oh, this is something I want to change. And then we have to get accountable. And that's where that's where it gets really hard, because you could make a change and you feel really, really awesome about it for like a week or two or three. And then when things get hard, unless there's some sort of an accountability it, it, in place, it's very hard to keep those changes going. Totally. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, you know, it starts with a seed, right? It's like an idea. Like, okay, well, if I'm going to change, how am I going to change? What am I going to do, right? And then you have to just keep going forward and doing it to prove that you could do it, you know? Yeah. So one thing I wanted to talk, I want to shift gears for a second here and talk a little bit about, about travel. And the reason I say that is because, you know, a lot of times those of us who are, who are in menopause, you know, we have a little bit of disposable income and we're ready to, to take some time off and travel. And, um, you know, you've said you've got some, you know, you've changed, you've changed the face of travel. So let's, let's start with how travel helped you find your inner power and what that means. Totally. So I grew up in Hawaii, so I very much had the Moana backstory. Like I always wondered what was, what lies beyond the shore, you know? Um, but I also grew up in a family of six and on an island, like travel was not feasible. It was not financially a thing that we did. Um, and yeah, so I was always curious about the world, but for me, travel almost started like, like I was just running, you know what I mean? Like once the gates could open, once I graduated, once I had like the time and space to get out, I was like, I have to go see what's out there, you know? So I moved to New Zealand, sold everything I owned, got a working holiday visa when I was like 22. Um, and I worked for a company that did Lord of the Rings tours in New Zealand and lived in a two bedroom house with eight travelers and, you know, just really like found the kind of pulse of travel that really excited me. And, you know, I would hear all the time from other people about different destinations and, um, and that would excite me, you know, they would come back and talk about China and I'd be like, oh, you know, I never really was interested in China, but now I really want to go, you know? And, um, so travel for me just like completely became my identity. Like it's, it was what fed me. And I just loved that every single day was different, that I could decide so many things in one single day. Like if I was tired, I could chill. If I, you know what I mean? Like I had 
so many decisions that I could make and I still thrive on that kind of feeling. Like when I am traveling and I'm in an environment that is not familiar to me, it excites me. <laughs> like the potentials and the possibilities excite me. So I moved to New Zealand, um, but I wasn't working in travel at the time and I came back to the US and was working three jobs and just kind of saving money and not knowing what I was going to do with it. Um, and then again, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty intuitive if you haven't picked that up. So, and then again, I, I took a, a, a <laughs> I heard in the middle of the night as I was sleeping, like I was looking at a guidebook for women. And in my dream, I was going, oh my God, that's so smart. This is totally your calling. Like you should have done this. Um, and I remembered the dream like midway through my work day the next day. And I started Googling guidebooks for women and it did not exist. So, so I was like, this came to me for a reason and I have to do it. So like three months later, I put my notice in, I told my boss like, Hey, I'm going to be leaving to do this thing. I called a lawyer. I started an LLC. You know, this was my first business. I was very young. I had no idea what I was doing. And then three months later I was in Thailand writing our first guidebook. So yeah. <laughs> my That's first so business, great. my first business was called go girl guides. Yeah. And we, we wrote travel guidebooks for women. And are one, they still available? They are still available. Yep, we're about to put out our India guidebook, actually. Um, Great. But then I went on tour, and I was talking about travel, and it was just, I was having these conversations that were so electric and, like, you know, went on for hours. So I said, I need to do this in a bigger way. So then I started Women's Travel Fest, which is a, a now has grown to be now a three-day annual conference. It's sold out every year. <laughs> it's it's truly amazing. And then I was talking, you know, I was having these conferences, getting people excited about travel. And I was like, okay, now it's time to take you traveling. So then I started Damesley, which is a tour company. So for me, travel was a passion that turned into a business. Um, and at every single point along the way, I had zero idea what I was doing. And I always stress that because it's like, you know, we don't think we can do things, right? Because it's like, I didn't know how to write guidebooks. I had no idea how to publish a book. I didn't know how to create a conference. <laughs> like, who do I right, think yeah, I am? Right. The audacity, you know? <laughs> yeah. But I, th I mean, I think that's really good because, you know, the, one of the big things about, you know, creating a business is to fail forward and to, and to test ideas and, and to do stuff, you know, in a, in a minimum viable product sort of way. And it sounds like you've been doing that all along. Um, but how, you know, as somebody who's like livelihood is so entrenched in travel, uh, how did COVID affect that for you? It was horrible. <laughs> Everything stopped, right? Right. So the last Women's Travel Fest was held March 8th through the 10th in New York City in 2020. And if you remember, oh. borders closed on wow. the 13th, right? So I came home from this massive event, 400 people. Everyone's so excited. We're all like... You know, and the advice was like, cover your cough, you know, <laughs> like use hand sanitizer. Like at that point we weren't where we are. Right. And so to watch everything fall from that point, I was terrified for a long time. You didn't contract COVID in, in New York. It, it remains to be seen. <laughs> like I ended up okay. testing positive um, for antibodies months down the road and I came back from Travel Fest really tired, like really tired. But then again, it's Travel Fest. I'm up at four in the morning, so yeah. I don't know. Um, but luckily, you know, and, and I remember thinking like, oh God, what have I done to my community? Like, I'm gonna be a hot spot. I'm gonna be on the news. Like, I was yeah. so scared, you know, and thank goodness. Yeah, I can imagine. Thank goodness, you know, nobody, nobody that I know of got very sick at Travel Fest, but it was just yeah, a terrifying I, time. I was I was work. I worked the first wave in New York. I was a, I was still working as a surgeon then, and that was that was probably the thing that really pushed me over the edge. That that made it so that I wasn't I was ready to leave medicine altogether, uh, because it got things got really weird, and and it was really hard to see all these people die. You know, yeah, so it was so hard, and it's so scary because you're like, you know, as a human, you're just like, God, I'm I'm seeing everybody that I love like in panic. I'm in panic. And then financially, if you work in travel, you're like, I have useless skills. I create yeah. conferences. I've been a bartender. Nothing's open. You know, like I have nothing that I can contribute to this moment, right? But after like two solid weeks of more or less hiding under my covers, I remember being like, you got to get up. You got to do something, right? You have yeah. to like, 
you have this weird time in your life when you're not traveling all of a sudden, you know, and I was in a new relationship and it's like, you have to use this time for something. So that's when I started writing the book. And it was Good like, job. in hindsight, it was the best time to have these kinds of conversations because everybody was home. So like yeah. everybody was available. And so I would sit on my computer on Zoom and like have these hour long interviews with women, just heart to heart, like, tell me what you've been through. Like, who, who stood mm-hmm. in your way and how did you prove them wrong? And like those conversations made me feel like I'm working on something again. I'm excited about something again. I'm a part of something that's bigger than me that feels positive and empowering and isn't just terrifying. You know? <laughs> so. Well, I think it's really important to have a purpose and, and it sounds like you were able to, you know, kind of get out of the COVID funk and find yourself a purpose and make it work. And I think that's really, really great. And so what, um, what would you, what would you say to the ladies here who like want to start taking some action and you know, how, how can they become a, an, an unstoppable bat, badass, as you say in your, in your notes here? I think it honestly just starts with taking steps forward. I think we get way stuck in the paralysis phase of things where it's not quite right yet and we don't quite know yet. And, you know, sometimes it takes a little while, especially if you're a creative person, to get the exact formula down for what you want, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, for this book, for example, like, I didn't know the shape that it was going to take. I didn't know who was going to end up being in it, how I was going to organize it. I just had to start doing it and I had to start sharing it. So I was telling people, I'm writing this book. It's called Tell Her She Can't. It's full of awesome women who defied the odds. You know, it's full of these badasses. And people were like, yes, this is awesome. Like They just liked that, you know? And then it came down to like, okay, I'm getting close to the deadline that I need to be done writing. Like, how the hell does this all fit together? Like, how does this puzzle piece, how do I organize this? How do I put my stories in it? Like, how do I choose which stories to include? Because I spoke to over 100 women. I had to choose 35 stories. So... (laughs) It was really hard, Um, but in that instance, what worked for me is like I slept next to a notebook and I would get all these kinds of ideas like really late at night, which is so frustrating because I just want to sleep, right? But at two in the morning, you're like, oh, okay, but this can go there. And like you'd have these sort of bursts of creative inspiration. But what kept me accountable was that I shared it and I talked about it before it was ready, you know? So if you have an idea, like the first thing I ever do when I have an idea for a business or a project, I buy the domain and I save the social handles. Like do those two things and then you can sit on it for a while and think about how you want it. Just move forward. Just buy the thing, you know, you got to like taking, you know, taking action, action breeds clarity. And the more action you take, the, the, the better it's going to be. And it's, it's so important to just take, you know, an action step towards your goal every single day it's impossible to fail you know what's one thing i can do today that that i know that i can get done and that's that's how change happens that's how we that's how we get better so you just have to take little just little steps little steps you know yep it has to be little you got to chunk it all down but like saving domain names that costs a little bit of money but like registering a page on facebook that's free so just start doing that and don't worry that you have zero followers or you know, you don't know how it's going to take shape yet. Like just create. That's, Mm. that's how, that's how I get through it. It's like, but then (laughs) it can also be a trap for me because I'm like, every time I take a shower, I come up with a new business. So you have to like (laughs) narrow down which one you want to do, you know? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's easy for creative types to kind of get stuck in shiny object syndrome. And so it's hard for, it's hard for people like us to really follow things through to the end. And that's where, you know, maybe having accountability really helps. And that's, I think that was a really good hack for, you know, going, going public on that and saying, this is what I'm working on. I want to be, it's going to be ready at this time. You know, here's what, here's what, how you can, you know, kind of get it, that sort of thing. And it was amazing to see the response to that. So like, because I did that, when the book came out, people were so excited. (laughs) Like my book army was bad ass like they were out so buying great. the book they were sharing the book they were taking photos of themselves in the tetons with the book that you know i mean like it they propelled that book to become a bestseller like they really pushed that book forward and That's it's be, it's and it's, uh, yeah and it's like every creative project you know it's yours but it's not yours like it's yours but it belongs to the greater good right 
-hmm. And there were definitely times that I had such paralyzing anxiety because I was talking about my childhood stuff, you know, and I was like, oh God, like I would, 2 a.m. I'd be like, I got to delete my Instagram. Like I can't go public with this. I have to pull the plug on this. Like I can't do it, you know, but then I would think about all the other women who are in that book and how strong they are. And if I, if I say my story isn't good enough, then I'm saying their story isn't good enough. And that's not true. So, yeah. you know. Now that's really good. Was, before we close, was there anything else you were hoping to share today? today? Well, I mean, I just wanted to have a conversation about this. This is like, yeah. I love talking about resilience and defiance um, and travel. So yeah. if you want to come to Women's Travel Fest, the next one's in Portland, March 4th through the 6th. Um, Portland, Oregon? Or Portland, Portland Oregon. Yeah. Okay. So super excited about that. And I just want Yay. anyone listening to this to remember that like you have everything you need to go out and change your life and live your dreams. You know, it's just, it just happens one step at a time. That's great. Where can people find you? I'm all over the internet at go Kelly Lewis, um, or tell us you can't. All right. Well, thanks so much for being a part of the menopause movement today. Everyone go and buy her book. It is Tell Her She Can't and you can get it on Amazon and we'll hook that up in the show notes. Did you know that menopause is not a medical condition? Most doctors don't know this either. I like to say that menopause is the privilege of a long life and to really take hold of our lives in menopause, we have to unlearn what society and the medical establishment has told us about menopause. Thanks so much for being a part of the menopause movement.